Hey, you rascals, guess what? This video is sponsored by Polly. We made it, boys. <laughs> oh, my ass. You know, when a YouTube's biggest technology content creation channel gets compromised by none other than a bogus sponsorship offer, and then shortly after I myself receive an email with a sponsorship offer, I couldn't help but go... But apparently, no. This is indeed a legitimate sponsorship offer, and not only that, it actually has bearing on my field of interest. None of that tank of warships or raids of legend shadows nonsense. You see, a few months ago, I made a video where I damn near literally shat my collective pants as I discovered and experimented with locally generated AI texture solution called Stable Diffusion. It immediately sent me to Cloud Fucking 9 because, for me, as an indie game developer, this had potential for opening up unfathomably innumerable creative pathways and saving me a massive amount of time. As a practical example, there's this prototype that requires a particular texture for a derelict parking lot. I'm imagining asphalt that has lost its color due to constant exposure to the sunlight and it's lined with cracks out of which pale orange dead grass is seen sprouting. Now, over the years, I have amassed a number of texture packs from both royalty-free and commercial sources. However, even with my personal texture hoard tapping out a 4TB hard drive, none of the pavement textures even come close to matching this particular imagery I have in my head. I dreaded that the way to go from here would be to painstakingly paint and kitbash my own texture from what I have available, which is generally expected as the way to go. However, as an indie developer, texture creation is probably not my top most favorite subject. And this is where this whole AI-generated texture solution had taken the world of 3D modeling by storm. Everyone was talking about it, and everyone was making videos on it. Now, as great as Stable Diffusion is, it still had a few shortcomings that would need to be addressed. For one, only people running Windows who are sporting a high VRAM capacity NVIDIA graphics card equipped with a particular type of GPU cores met the requirement for running this tool. This effectively meant that the Mac users had to resort to some sideways shenanigans that would shower them in cease and desist letters from Apple, and for Linux users, well, as usual, every Linux issue is ultimately resolved by installing Windows. So take it however you want. Second, the tool only generated what we refer to as the diffuse or albedo map, which is basically just a color texture. That's great and all, but games require so much more than just the color map to achieve a more immersive depiction of materials. Besides the color map, you also need to make use of a matching normal map, which interacts with the game's lighting to create an illusion of bumps and crevices, a displacement map, which can um, displace the texture pixels to create further depth through either moving vertices of the mesh or by using the parallax layering, thus achieving a similar effect without requiring a high poly mesh to do so. Then there's the ambient occlusion, which is a natural phenomenon of light being incapable of reaching tight crevices. This effect is everywhere, and thus generally you don't tend to pay attention to it until you realize something looks weird because it's missing. And finally, you have the roughness map, which communicates how smooth and shiny or coarse and bumpy a surface is, dictating how it may reflect the surrounding environment. Besides that, there's also a metallic map and some supplementary maps you might want to use for your surfaces, but that's about it. Locally run texture generation solutions like Stable Diffusion would only provide you with one of these maps. It would fall onto you to generate the rest of the maps through tools like MindText or Materialize. Until now. You see, it was inevitable that some crafty Joe was gonna jump on this tech and start pushing it forward to close these gaps in functionality. And earlier this month, I was reached by just such a developer working on just such a tool, offering me to take a look at what they have to bring to the table and record my general reaction and interaction with it. Enter Poly, a web-based texture generation tool that produces a proper stack of texture maps for your good old PBR workflow. After my glaring review of Stable Diffusion, Poly developers have reached out to me with the trial plan to test drive their tool. And after some experimentation, my first impression varied between, 
what to holy shit and keep in mind that i was already blown away by stable diffusion at this point so poly had a particular expectation to meet i decided to do a head-to-head -head comparison with something that we all already have free access to stable diffusion based blender plugin called dream textures by carson country a tool you've seen me cover on this channel a little while back now Polly's documentation outlines that to get the most effective result, the prompts need to be more prosaic and technical in nature. Something akin to a comma delimited list of key features and characteristics. The good news is that you can browse their library of generated materials to get prompt suggestions. Now, my first impression is that Polly seems to have found a way to fine tune the model to be geared specifically towards something that instantly creates a usable texture. Oftentimes, for each usable poly result, it would take me multiple stable diffusion attempts to get something usable. And in stable diffusion, funny enough, for some reason I can get better results using a custom mode rather than the built-in texture one. Go figure. I tried to run the same prompt multiple times to see how wildly the results could vary and all in all I'd say Poly produces more usable textures per attempt compared to Stable Diffusion, which definitely saves you on time as one of the sinkholes of AI texture generation is how much time you can spend searching for that perfect texture. I must admit, sometimes Poly will land on a real banger of a texture set but on the other hand, I've not really been able to get the same level of fidelity as their demo materials available on the front page, even if I used the same prompt that the material description came with. It's not to say that the textures I got were unusable, but it does make me wonder how they pulled it off with their own generator. This is pretty universal downside of AI generated content where you're left to the whims of the algorithm as to whether or not you're going to get something fitting for your application. I do have a few ideas of how to deal with it, but I'll leave those for later in the video. So how did Polly achieve such interesting results? Well, we know that the random generation is dependent on the random seed being fed into the algorithm that acts as a catalyst for the vector which the generator will take. If the seed is the same, then the same prompt should yield the same result every time. So perhaps Polly can include the seed of their demo materials in the description and give us the ability to supply the seed manually into the UI so that we can try out our own variations of the prompts in conjunction with the seed that produce these spectacular looking results. After a bit of playing around, which most of us will do whenever we get a new toy, I went forth and test drive this texture generation tool in a practical application. So I decided to use one of my active projects called Dreadtail. This is a small game that takes place in a swampy forest, so some kind of an earthy, leafy texture set would be most appropriate. Polly produced a nice stone pebble mixture that I could use as a masking texture around trees and buildings. I use Zillin's terrain tool for Gadot Engine, which allows me to supply multiple terrain textures with individual scaling values. Now, after scaling, the textures actually turned out to be quite fitting, save for a few caveats, which I'm going to leave until later. This game has a few objects that needed texturing, so I wanted to see how efficient it might be to use Poly to generate seamless, ready-to-use, one-stop-shop drop-in materials that I can quickly slap on some more generic models. Poly offers a neat little prototyping panel where you can test your prompts and get some rapidly generated texture suggestions, out of which you can choose one that fits your needs, which you can then upscale, tile, and generate PBR maps for. The texture I went with was a concrete texture featuring some crevices and surface damage. And because the texture featured no distinguishable details that immediately pop out revealing a tiled pattern, I could use Gadot's triplanar mapping to slap this texture on a model without having to worry about any UV unwrapping. The end result, I would say, is ideal if you need an immediate drop-in solution right on the spot. Now, Poly can also be integrated into your own texturing pipeline, as I decided to take one of the earliest models and finally texture it with something more scene appropriate. 
I took the textures generated by Poly and slapped all the relevant maps onto the fill layer in Substance Painter, adjusting the scale and position to feature a more interesting region of the texture. With the Poly's base texture in place, I could now layer all the additional details, such as the edge damage, the lightness variations in the ripped portions of the concrete, dirt and dust accumulations in the corners, and lastly, a generous set of moss patches dynamically distributed by one of Substance Painter's mask generators. So far, as a texture generation solution, Poly seems to be moving in the right direction of checking all the right boxes. However, it's not to say that it doesn't need work in some key areas. So here's a list of things I found myself wishing I had access to in this tool. First things first, out of the pettiest of details, currently the editor seems to not remember the choice of display mesh between texture generations. I usually like to view my texture on a cube, however the closest option Poly currently offers is a plane, and every time a new texture is generated it seems to revert back to the sphere, so I need to keep going to the panel and make the switch every time. Also adding a cube model would, in my opinion, be a good addition. Secondly, Poly currently does not allow you to rotate the lighting environment, giving you only the option to orbit the camera instead. Rotating the lighting environment, in my opinion, is a key feature to helping us assess the performance of normal and height maps in 3D texturing and mapping software. Programs like Mindtax and Substance Painter have demonstrated this to be essential, especially when paired with opposing warm and cold lighting sources at each end. It is a feature I have come to expect to see in any respectable texturing tool. Another note, I find that sometimes the texture generator ends up producing a particularly vivid detail or spot which will end up actually becoming a focal point in the game. Like a darker textured patch on an otherwise brightly colored base texture. Now, in certain cases this is not an issue, however, this is where an optional feature of performing brightness averaging to blend in the values of dark and light texture features would come in handy. Preferably something adjustable. And sure, we can do that ourselves by opening the texture with some editing software on our end, but that just means the poly will be missing out on an added value proposition. More on that later. Oh, and um, you can circumvent the 240 character prompt limit by copy-pasting the text into the prompt box instead of typing it. Whether or not the string gets truncated on the server side, only Polly knows. Also, one particular petty annoyance is that the side panels for the shape, height and lighting for the preview cannot be pinned to the side and will always collapse as soon as you leave the panels. You will not believe how often those tools get used. When trying to assess the generated material, it is pivotal to be able to switch between multiple mesh shapes and lighting environments to quickly assess the suitability of the generated textures. In fact, the features within these panels would be used more often than the various generation tools you can find in the permanently pinned panel on the left. But it's not to say that they should collapse either. Throughout this preview, you will find me constantly switching between different shapes and lighting environments to gauge the final result. If you can let us pin that panel and perhaps minimize the amount of menu diving, which, yes, it's kind of a petty thing, but at the same time, you gotta offer every value you have when competition is this tough, we would appreciate it. Especially for the environmental lighting choice panel, instead of going for a drop down menu, perhaps it could be a list of buttons that are visible at all times for those rapid switches. So, of course one of the main benefits about Poly is that they produce all the texture maps required for the PBR workflow in a game engine. The only downside is how limited your controls are in regards to these individual maps. Take the height map, for instance. When it comes to more complex, layered materials, I found that having a singular height parameter to be a limiting factor that causes Poly to sacrifice some key features of the texture to be incorrectly height mapped. Take for example the mossy brick textures. It would make sense that dark crevices and holes are mapped as concave intrusions into the brick, but the moss itself would be a convex growth layered on top of the brick in the opposite height direction. I believe Poly would greatly benefit from adding some sort of a way of layering multiple heights on top of each other to create a more accurate model. 
and I strongly believe that this is something that would work better if Polly provides us, the users, with the tools to define what needs to intrude and what needs to protrude. Perhaps some kind of a color picker that allows you to set certain colors or values to specific heights, layering multiple heights together based on the color range or perhaps brightness. In terms of the overall quality of the textures generated, I must say I feel a bit of a limit in the model that Poly is using to generate their textures. And this has nothing to do with level of detail or complexity. Particularly, it seems to struggle with dark themed textures. Mainly, I saw it struggle with dark pavements, paints and construction material that needs to be dark in nature. Poly seems to struggle to comprehend what I mean when I say dark pavement, as a lot of the times I would get a texture no darker than an average gray value. Perhaps this could be remedied by a color selection wheel where you can choose which color and value the generator should bias itself towards. Another marginally confusing hiccup uh, that should in theory be a very easy fix is that the UI of Poly places its rapid texture generation right beside its step-by-step -step granular prompt workflow, which they refer to as the patching tool. Now, what's the issue? Well, when you use the rapid generator, the tool performs all the steps needed to produce a full array of texture maps in one single sweeping motion. And when done, the interface automatically pops you into the material view window where you are presented with your final result. However, when I switched to the granular step-by-step -step process, which is the patching tool, I was confused as why none of my materials yielded any result. Nothing was showing in the material view. After some rooting around the interface, I realized that, as it turns out, when you start using the patching tool, you need to manually switch to the raw image panel where you will be presented with all the prompt results you've entered up until this point. So it was a mere mistake of not being in the right window, but if the interface pops you in the final render page when you're using the quick generator, then I would imagine that it should also automatically open the texture choice viewer when you're using the patching tool to avoid confusion like this. This is likely a simple oversight and should be very easy to fix with just a little bit of JavaScript. Also, it appears that when you're using a quick generate feature, you still seem to receive four variations of patching textures in the patching window. And I gotta say, a lot of the times, one of those textures will end up looking better than what I'm presented with in the final render window from quick generate. I think this sort of multiple choice workflow that the patching tool offers to us is going to be a lot more useful than the instant material generator, where you're getting one fully formed result and hoping for the best. Perhaps patching tool can expand into giving six or even eight suggestions, and perhaps it would be beneficial to allow users to regenerate the suggestions based on the chosen image, thus guiding the generator in the direction you see fit instead of settling in on the one choice we went with. I know you can do it, Polly. You have the image upload feature right there. Except it would be nice if we could just tell it to use one of the images it has already generated instead of having us to download it and then re-upload it right back. After all, you already have those images on your server, so I'm sure you'll appreciate the savings in web requests and traffic. Speaking of the patching tool, I gotta admit, when I saw the button with the name Patching Tool within Polly's UI, my first impression was that this is where you could patch the various segments of all your AI-generated textures together, mixing and matching the useful features and components from other generated results. However, at this point of writing, the patching simply means that you can patch or rephrase your written text prompt with new terminology before sending it off to the generator to try and get a better result. And that brings me to a particularly uncomfortable dilemma. As much as I'm conflicted to hold back on any sort of harsh criticism, because Polly has sponsored me to do this review, I feel it's going to be disingenuous if I don't pose this particular question. What does Polly offer that is actually of value to us, game developers and 3D artists, compared to what is already available? We already have free tools like Stable Diffusion, 
Poly can generate textures, make them seamless, upscale them to larger resolutions to get more detail, and it can produce the rest of the texture maps required by modern game engines. Well, by this point in time, Stable Diffusion can run standalone as a Blender plugin. It sets itself up with all the necessary dependencies for you with a mere push of a button. It's free and runs locally on your machine, and if you're on a Mac or Linux and can't run Stable Diffusion because of driver or OS compatibility issues, you can still run Windows in a virtual machine just for texture generation. It generates seamless textures and has built-in upscaler. And as for all the generated maps, you can use applications like Mindtex, which costs 20 bucks for a lifetime license, and Materialize, which costs nothing to generate all the missing texture maps for your game engine. And those apps take even less time to produce those generated maps than Poly's service can handle at this moment. Not only that, both Materialize and Mindtax offer a slew of adjustable parameters to precisely dial in things like various detail levels of your normal map, ambient occlusion map strength and contrast, displacement amounts at various detail levels, and roughness amounts based on the color map being used as a source driver. Even those sliders offer an infinitely higher level of control and precision than Poly's six preset choices at a fraction of to no cost at all. So what does Poly offer that is of value? Now, I am by no means trying to dunk on Poly with these comments. If anything, I feel this feedback can help them identify what us developers are looking to get out of tools like these. After all, you want to get your money's worth out of your monthly subscription. The next day. So here's the thing. The most important aspect that AI texture generation tool developers need to realize is that their tool needs to solve a particular problem that no other tool can solve. As indie game devs and artists, what is our problem that this tool needs to solve? Well, we seek to minimize the amount of time we spend on less fulfilling tasks like texture hunting or texture making, unless you're a texture artist and you enjoy your job. What we seek is a one-stop shop solution for producing that perfect texture with the fewest steps in between without sacrificing or limiting our creative vectors. And the problem is that this is something that can't be done with just a prompt-based generator that attempts to make a perfect image right from the get-go. We, the artists, the game developers, the modelers, want to be in control of the work that we produce. And that comes from the level of control we have over the image. If the only control vector we have is the text we type into the text box, which can, with a single word, severely alter the result that may have already been almost right, then that in turn severely limits the amount of control we have over the image we produce. Like it or not, AI can't read our minds, and the textures that come out of these generators often fall just within the ballpark of what we have in mind. To make these generated textures really work and fit what we imagine, the texture has to go through some form of additional editing. Long, long ago, in the distant past, before AI generators, we would take multiple textures and photographs and kit bash or patch them together, creating something that fits our precise need. The practical problem of AI texture generation is that it attempts to do too much in one step, to make a perfect texture in one motion while being completely random in nature. And the usefulness or fitness of the texture is at complete mercy of the ethereal neural network gods. Sometimes we can get lucky. It could happen in a few minutes or a few hours of relentless prompting. Even with a precisely worded prompt, it is rare for a texture to hit the bullseye of what we seek right off the bat. And oftentimes the texture you get will only have some amount of features you are looking for. As artists, we would usually not settle for the first thing that sort of marginally fits the bill. And the invisible pit of AI generators is that you may end up spending hours trying to roll and re-roll the dice to see if perhaps the next one will be closer to what you see. This is where traditional texture making allows us to keep the best features of one texture, but add on top of it something else from another without altering the original 
And even though Poly and many other texture generators allow you to supply a source image, it often results in the original being augmented in some way we do not desire. So how about instead of trying to make a tool that attempts to hit the bullseye, but most often than not fails within a margin, why not give us the ability to take the best parts of the generated prompt and let us combine all the elements together? Since AI-generated texture solutions are meant to help ease the process of texture creation, I believe that AI-based texture solutions need to start integrating traditional image editing tools with some sort of AI-assisted twist that you cannot get in traditional painting software. I have on countless occasions been able to generate a nice base texture only to wish I could just add a little bit of tiny extra detail from some other generated prompt without affecting the base one. Give us things like layering multiple textures, masking out certain parts of a layered image, make the mask process smart and content aware, give us mask blending or perhaps have an AI tool analyze the layered images that are loosely masked together and have it generate a much more polished version of the same image. Have all of this be doable right within your browser application so we don't have to leave its interface and resort to external software. One of the issues I found when generating that leafy soil texture for the Dread Tail game was that even if the subject of the texture matched a forest swampy setting, I would need to do a bunch of color correction to make it sit well with the texture already established in the terrain. Why not give us some scope of in-browser image color correction, such as hue, saturation and value? curves, levels, things that would allow us to use your tool as a one-stop shop for producing ready-to-go final textures. Poly needs to have a valid value proposition that stands out from what is already available. I will admit that the generative model they have trained is already of impressive value as you're much more likely to generate something useful within fewer iterations than with tools like Stable Diffusion. However, if after using Poly to generate the texture, we still have to open them in our editing software and do further color correction and patching in additional details, that's something that we can already do with all the other freely available texture generators and open source image editors. I think that Poly needs to think outside the box of what texture artists and game developers truly value. As it is right now, I see texture generators as no more or less as other sources of raw texture material, something that needs further editing, patching, color correction and adjustment before they could be used in an engine. Something that is but an ingredient in a larger workflow. And with all these free AI texture generators already available for anyone with even a marginally powerful GPU, currently Poly doesn't seem to solve enough of my problems as a game developer to consider the monthly subscription to be worthwhile. If, however, Poly can turn itself into a one-stop shop solution, allowing me to generate, layer, combine, mask, color correct, and edit the imagery right within the browser so that the final product needs no further editing in external software, then it would truly be an invaluable tool solving a problem which no other software can. All right, so this is the end of my written review. So anything from this point on is improvised. Final thoughts, I like it. I like the consistency and reliability of the textures you get out of the Poly's generation tool. As I said, I had to do way less digging to get that uh, good usable texture, where with Stable Diffusion, it's a bit of a hit or miss. I do wish that uh, there was more control given to us, however. Something that allows us to adjust multiple height layers, color correction, all that good stuff. Um, if I have to involve additional external software, which right now all of us have to do that anyways, then what is Poly really solving except for giving us a better generative model? It's really got to improve this spectrum of problems that it solves. I honestly, when I'm rapidly prototyping or putting together some sort of a mini game, if I can get Poly to output the perfect texture, which always will have to go through some form of editing and 
layering additional detail, patching, masking things in and out, then hell, monthly subscription seems uh, quite worth it because it solves one of my problems, which is how much time I spend um, digging around for textures in um, all these commercial websites, free websites. I mean, there's a trade there, right? You trade in the time you save for a bit of a monthly fee. So I say, I think it's worth it. Um, so maybe if I, if I switch my development style where I leave all of the texturing for the end of the development cycle, which is much more akin to what you would find in a studio or a small development team where they would just work with block meshing, no textures or placeholders in the beginning, uh, then by consolidating all of the texturing to a specific time frame, then I mean, even now you could spend the uh, spend the bucks on the monthly fee and get all your texturing out of the way. In my personal opinion, I don't really work that way because it, it gets really monotonous. So uh, this is why I really like stable diffusion because it's free. It doesn't doesn't take your monthly fee uh, to run it. You can just quietly sit on your computer until you need it. And uh, if I'm prototyping, pops up, uh, generate a couple of textures. Some of them will be misses. A couple of them will be pretty decent and one of them will be a hit. And um, I'll you know, spend, what, 20, 30 minutes trying to generate the map, which kind of sucks, which coincidentally is where poly shines through. You're much more likely to get a usable texture in fewer attempts than you would with stable diffusion. So if you want to go ahead and test out the tool, poly has provided a coupon called concept. You can use this on your checkout in order to get a one month free and test drive the tool. Thanks everybody for watching and I'll see you in the next one.